On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Trita Parsi. He is the president of the National Iranian American Council. Uh, welcome to the program, Trita. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, let's uh, give us first the the broad outlines of the deal that was announced. I guess it was Saturday uh, night uh, local time um, uh, between the United States, uh, along with uh, five other nations, including uh, Russia, China, Germany, France, uh, Great Britain, and Iran. Yes. Yeah, so what happened? I mean, this is quite historic. So now. For the first time since 2003, there's an interim deal that actually freezes the Iranian nuclear program. There's not going to be any expansion of it. They're going to see some of the most sensitive activities, and they're going to do so in return for some limited sanctions relief. But down the road, once they reach the final phase of this negotiation, what's on the table then is full lifting of the nuclear sanctions which then can, um, in return for far greater transparency from the Iranian side, which in turn then will create uh, a much, much more positive situation in which the Iranian path towards a nuclear bomb essentially will be closed. Okay, so let's, let's I mean, let's step back. What are the things that the, and, and this is, there's a, uh, and I, and I want to talk about this, and, and of course, um, uh, you wrote about um, uh, about this the, these this relationship between the United States and Iran um, in, uh, in in your book. Um, I guess that came out a couple of years ago. A uh, single roll of the dice. Uh, but let's uh, w- heading into these negotiations, which we now see uh, reported, and, and we'll talk about the significance of this that have been uh, more or less ongoing for eight months now. Uh, this round, anyways, um, what is it that the United States seeks, and what is it that Iran seeks? Well, the bottom line for the United States is to make sure that the Iranians cannot build a nuclear weapon, and that they won't have a breakout capability that enables them to build a weapon in such a short time span that it cannot be detected and it cannot be stopped. This deal will achieve that. Now, this is still just the interim phase of it, but if it reaches the final stage. And unfortunately, reaching the final stage is going to be difficult because there are spoilers on both sides. There's elements on both sides who will try to sabotage it. Uh, From the U.S. side, for instance, if Congress goes forward and passes new sanctions, that is a very explicit and clear violation of the deal, and everything will fall apart. And and, and (laughs) we should say... just a, a, a pardon, but but we should say that this this uh, eminent move or the threat of this eminent move by Congress was um, one of the reasons that really made it so important that this happened now. I'm not so sure, to be completely frank with you. I think that the threat of sanctions from Congress actually in some ways limited the time frame for the Obama administration to get this done, more so than on the Iranian side. Um, If Congress had gone forward with new sanctions at a time when the Iranians are showing unprecedented uh, flexibility, what that would have done was that it would create an impression on the international stage that Iran was reasonable, but Congress would not take yes for an answer. If that narrative would have stuck, then the Iranians would have been able to essentially see portions of the international sanctions regime unravel without them giving any concession. Interesting. And so so the, the, the role of Congress thinking that it's some sort of a bad cop that actually makes things happen, I, I very much doubt. And on the contrary, I think uh, it's acting more like a crazy cop and that is making the president look like the weak cop, not the good cop. Interesting. So, uh, so if I hear what you're saying correctly, the uh, uh, Congress pushing in this way would have hobbled um, the 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 U.S. agenda because um, ultimately it would have um, uh, weakened the sanctions regime internationally, and this is ultimately uh, what Iran wants in terms of uh, of, of much needed funds for their economy. had is that they want to make sure that they are um, 
that they get their nuclear program essentially recognized and that they're not going to be at the end of this with no access to nuclear technology. That's been a very clear red line from them. They believe they have a right to enrich. Um, so they've been very firm on these two points. And a again, I, I think whereas pressure and many other these things uh, do play a role in all of this, I think one should be careful not to exaggerate this because reality is a deal of this kind could have been reached 10 years ago. In 2005, for instance, Iranians, actually then led by Rouhani as their lead negotiator, offered to cut, uh, cap their nuclear program at 3,000 centrifuges. At the time, they only had about, I think they were a little bit lower than that number. Today, they have 19,000 centrifuges. We've lost so much by insisting on unrealistic objectives, insisting that they would have to go down to zero. And the reason why we are now actually getting a deal is because, in my view, both sides have exhausted their pipe dreams. The Iranian pipe dream that they could just present the West with a fait accompli of a completely unfettered program, the Western uh, uh, pipe dream that they could get the Iranian nuclear program down to zero. None of these objectives were achievable, and now both sides have actually become reasonable, and that's why there's a deal. And, and I just want to go back, as you cut out for a moment, when you talk about the two things that Iran wants at this point, just uh, restate that for us. What the Iranians are looking for is to make sure that at the end of this, they retain what they think is their right under the NPT, that as an NPT state, they can have enrichment and a peaceful program as long, of course, as they have answered the questions of the IEA and that there's no legitimate concerns in the international community about the nature of the Iranian program, which, of course, the Iranians have to accept, has to be combined with the most intrusive inspections regime that gives the international community the confidence that the Iranians are not and cannot cheat. And, and, and the second thing that the, the Iranians want out of this is obviously uh, access Thank to their funds. Relief. Absolutely. Sanctions relief is, is very, very critical. But it's interesting that there are offers that were made that in some aspects are more far-reaching than what we have today at a moment when none of these sanctions were here. Now, in this specific moment, as a result of the many mistakes that have been committed by the Bush administration in refusing to negotiate, one can make the argument that the sanctions have added a certain leverage that the U.S. needed at this point. But to say that sanctions got this resolved is not entirely true because this could have gotten resolved much earlier without any sanctions if we just had a more realistic and reasonable approach. Interesting. And so, I mean, give us a sense of what the, the you know, what is behind the, uh, obviously from a sanctions point of view, it is uh, to deal with economic uh, troubles in Iran. But from the perspective of, you know, being treated as, a legitimate member of uh, or treaty signatory to the uh, the nuclear proliferation treaty. What what are the domestic pressures uh, that 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 require that that um, uh, that status? Sorry, do you mean domestic pressures on the Iranian side or on the U.S. Side? on the Iranian side? Yeah. So um, you know this is interesting. They have an elite that is in some ways similar to the United States, perhaps uh, pursuing a, a discourse that is not the discourse that is out there in the public. So, you know, they've made a very big deal out of this, uh, and I think they have staked a lot of their credibility on making sure that they don't compromise on some of these red lines. I think the population probably would be more flexible because for obvious reasons they're not considering or concerning themselves with larger strategic issues. They're concerning themselves with day-to-day -day economic reason, uh, factors. Same thing is true here in the United States. At the end of the day, the population doesn't want to have a war. Um, and um, the polls show that there's far greater willingness to lift sanctions in return for nuclear concessions from Iran amongst the population than there is, for instance, in Congress. So you have a, um, a, a schism between uh, the public discourse and their views and the elite discourse in both countries. The elites tend to be more hawkish than the public is in both countries. And uh, why did this deal, it seemed like this was the deal that was uh, about to be um, uh, consummated a couple of weeks ago. France stepped in and, um, and basically prevented it from, from happening. What, what, what was behind French, uh, the French um, uh, issues two weeks ago, uh, and, and how were those resolved in this deal? It seems like there were several different factors that uh, 
prompted the French to do this. One being that the French president was traveling to Israel a couple of days later, and he wanted to do something per the request of Netanyahu that certainly would have earned him a more warm welcome in Israel than it otherwise would have happened. There may be also a factor that the French are trying to um, gain uh, some of the economic contracts from countries such as Saudi Arabia that the U.S. is likely going to lose uh, at least portions of as a result of the Saudis being very, very unhappy that the United States is negotiating with Iran. Thirdly, um, I think there may also be a fact that there is some tension between the uh, French uh, president and the American president because the French were the only country that was really with Obama on the idea of attacking Syria. And when Obama took a step back from that, it kind of left the French um, uh, alone uh, out in the cold there, and I think that was not deeply appreciated. There, in the French press, there was reports that the French jet fighters were essentially on the tarmac waiting to lift when they got the order that uh, the U.S. is actually not going to go forward with the bombing. So th there's a complexity of issues. At the end of the day, it seems that uh, their intervention ultimately did not have a significant impact. I know that some of the things that they had struck out in the original agreement had been put back in there by the uh, insistence of the Iranians. There may have been certain things on the Iraq reactor that have been tighter, but ultimately I think it's less than a footnote in the larger uh, history writing of this. The real critical thing going forward now is will both sides live up to their end of the bargain and will we be able to get to a phase two in which at that point there's going to be more concessions from the American side uh, than there currently is because in the first phase the vast majority of concessions are coming from the Iranian side. How much of uh, the, I guess it's approximately $7 billion that are going to be uh, released in some fashion or uh, another, how, how, much, how much does that represent of the uh, full dollar amount that, uh, you know, in terms of economic impact for the Iranians in the event that the sanctions regime uh, and all the assets were unfrozen? I mean, so what's there at the end of the rainbow from just that economic standpoint for Iran? It's really a drop in the water. It's really nothing uh, significant. Uh, uh, mindful of the fact that the main sanctions are going to continue throughout this period, this very minor uh, relief uh, doesn't change the fact that they're still losing a lot of money as a result of the other sanctions. The way this has been structured is to make sure that both sides retain some of their most important bargaining cards for the second phase of the negotiation. From the U.S. perspective, the, the belief is that banking sanctions and um, oil sanctions are the most important aspects of American leverage, and as a result, the U.S. is not going to give those up in the first phase. Similarly, from the Iranian perspective, added transparency, such as the ratification of the additional protocol, is something that the Iranians are not going to give up until the last phase of this negotiation either. So both sides are giving something, but they're retaining a lot of leverage for the next round. And, and so what, what are the factors that are going to go into, and, and um, well, let's, let's, uh, let's just start with this. I mean, uh, Saudi Arabia, in, in some respects, may be their, um, I, I guess, their allergy, if you will, to a deal between Iran and the United States, may even trump... Uh, Israel's allergy, uh, although I guess that's debatable, but give me your sense of what both Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, what their disposition is to this deal and how they will complicate the, uh, the consummation of a, of a, of a final uh, deal uh, down the road. I think from the Saudi and the Israeli perspective, uh, they have some diverging perspectives on this, but right now, tactically at least, they're quite united. They're very much uh, opposed to this deal. They have various fears. Um, the one that we oftentimes hear of is the idea that this actually would help the Iranian nuclear program or is not really rolling it back and things of that nature. Frankly, on a technical basis, that's entirely false. Um, uh, this is achieving far more uh, for um, stopping the nuclear program than any other measure that currently could be taken right now. And I think it's important to note that while the Israeli prime minister is saying that this is a, a bad uh, deal and historically a bad deal, the Israeli markets have reacted very positively to this because they realize that this is reducing the risk of a war and reducing the risk of a nuclear weapon. And as a result, it's actually good for the economy and good for everything else. From the Saudi perspective, 
the Saudis are really worried that if the U.S. and Iran negotiate, if they improve their relations, that, that those improved relations will come at the expense of Saudi Arabia's relationship with the U.S., Saudi Arabia's influence in the region, um, and its rivalry with Iran. It frankly hasn't got that much to do with the nuclear issue because any deal uh, between the U.S. and Iran probably would have been opposed by the Saudis. Interesting. And um, there's a report uh, from the BBC. Now, this is uh, apparently based on Israeli intelligence, but that um, uh, Saudi, uh, the Saudi Arabia is supposedly calling in its chits uh, to Pakistan, saying, you know, we financed a lot of the, uh, the building of uh, your nuclear arsenal. Uh, a couple of those were uh, reserved for us. We want them now. Are, are we going to see more of this type of posture from the Saudis? They are posturing a lot, but it's not really clear what options they have, because at the end of the day, what they're most worried about is that the United States no longer will be a protectorate of the Saudi regime. Remember, the primary enemy of the Arab Spring in the Middle East is the Saudi regime. They don't want to see the spread of democracy. They're very, very protective of the monarchies. And the United States has been an ally of theirs in protecting their authoritarian regime. There is a fear that the U.S. will no longer pay the price of protecting these regimes, mindful of the fact that it will have other options going forward. It's not as dependent on the oil from the Middle East. The oil from the Middle East is no longer as critical um, for the world economy, mindful of the way that new uh, oils have been, uh, oil reserves have been discovered uh, throughout the world. Um, so the question from the Saudis then is, who is going to protect them? I don't think China is going to come in and do that. All they'll do is that they'll agree to sell a lot of weapons to the Saudis. But beyond that, they're not going to protect the Saudis. Interesting. And, and so what are we, uh, it has been reported today, I guess uh, Reuters came out with the timeline, that these negotiations have been ongoing for uh, almost eight or nine months now, predating the time that uh, Rouhani uh, became elected uh, president. So what does this tell us about uh, the supreme leader and, and, and why is that important? Well, there were negotiations that were started already in 2012, in, in January of that year. Um, however, I think what happened is that after the elections in Iran, that's when you actually had a real bilateral secret channel between the United States and Iran open. Uh, and that's been going on for some time now since he got elected. It's apparently been absolutely critical in preparing the ground for this deal, which is not surprising. After so much, so many years of not talking to each other, it's not difficult to imagine that something of this kind was necessary in order to get the talks kick-started. The person from the American side that led those negotiations is uh, the Deputy uh, Secretary of State, um, Bill Burns, who is oftentimes referred to as one of the absolute best diplomats of his generation. So this was a top American talent taking care of this. And I'm personally a bit um, um, uh, disappointed that this achievement is not getting the fair amount of praise and, and appreciation uh, politically in Washington right now because of the political games that are currently being played. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, this was, uh, this is all a function of the healthcare.gov uh, website, isn't it? I mean, that's... I Without mean... a doubt. I mean, <laughs> politics is coloring all of this, but if we were to look at what is happening uh, here, just strictly objectively, this is far more than the Bush administration ever achieved with Iran. Right. So, well, uh, for, for that side to be so critical of it, I, I, I find... Um, you know, it's difficult not to see that being strictly uh, politically motivated. Right. I think it was Senator Cr uh, uh, um, uh, Cornyn from uh, Texas literally said that this is um, the reason why this deal came about was a function of distracting people from uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which is, I mean, it's uh, we, we will spend more time laughing about that in the second half of the program. But yeah, uh, I mean, the, the degrees of um, I mean, this is actually. One would think, you know, oftentimes people are saying that the Iranians are the masters of coming up with conspiracy theories. It seems like they have some competition from Texas right now. Yes, and frankly, there's other states too. But I'm curious as to, from your perspective, and maybe the perception, my perception is wrong, but it seems that the Supreme Leader has more trust in Rouhani 
uh, to make this deal than he did um, uh, th- than even. I mean, obviously, um, uh, but even uh, even more so than Katami, the uh, who was the last, I guess, arguably reformist uh, president. Absolutely. Um, remember, Rouhani is a deep, deep regime insider. Khatami was not. Khatami came from the outskirts of the regime, and they never, they never have a particularly good relationship with uh, Khamenei. Uh, Ahmadinejad, of course, also ended up having a tremendous amount of tension uh, with Khamenei, but nevertheless, even if he didn't, he was so despised by many other elements of the Iranian regime, so um, he really didn't have that type of uh, support that was needed. Um, so this is important because we want to make sure that that government can deliver on whatever they sign on to, and making sure that uh, Rouhani has the backing of Khamenei is important, just as much as it is important that the president has the backing of Congress so that the Iranians trust whatever the U.S. is saying at the negotiating table. I mean, in, in some respects, I guess, for uh, the to the extent that there's any Nixon to China dynamic here, it is really on uh, more of a reflection of Rouhani um, than anything coming from the United States. Well, I think, I personally think that the president, when he first got elected in 2008, uh, and when he started his uh, presidency in 2009, very much liked to do exactly what he's doing right now. I think this was his instinct for various reasons, one being that the Iranian election ended up being uh, so fraudulent and with such massive human rights abuses. It ate up a lot of his political space to be able to, to pursue that path, and, and the negotiations in 2009 ended up being a single roll of the dice, a gamble on a single roll of the dice, as the title of my book is. Then in 2010, actually, the Iranians signed on to the deal, but then the U.S. Congress was pushing so hard for sanctions, the president didn't dare to say yes to that deal because he feared that Congress was going to roll over him. Now, when he's in his second term, and he's already on such bad terms with Congress, it seems like... Uh, a, that is one of the factors as to why the president is pursuing this. But also, if you take a look at the rest of the region, where else does the U.S. now currently have the prospects of having a success on the foreign policy front? Even though the Iran issue is still a very tough issue, it is actually easier than Syria, Israel, Palestine. So what else would the president be doing right now if he wasn't doing this, particularly mindful of the fact that he must be starting to think about his legacy at some point? Right. Let's assume that uh, the the two uh, that Iran and the U.S. are able to codify um, at least the the spirit of of this sort of interim deal in some type of um, longer term deal. What are the implications? I mean, aside, of course, from averting uh, a war, uh, what are the implications long term in terms of what how it reshapes the region? I think this could be critical because this is, at the end of the day, not just about whether there's enrichment in Iran or whether there is centrifuges or the number of those centrifuges. This will define what uh, Iran's direction will be for decades to come. Will it be the direction of Ahmadinejad and his aggressive uh, posturing and confrontational style, or will it be an Iran that is identified and defined by the moderation and constructive and open approach of the Rouhani government. That's going to have significant repercussions for all other issues, uh, including Syria, Persian Gulf security, relations with Israel, Saudi Arabia, and ultimately, relationship with the United States. This in and of itself is not going to make U.S. and Iran partners or, or best friends, but it can open up the opportunity for a much, much better relationship than they currently have. And you have to ask yourself, when was the last time the U.S. lost an enemy in the Middle East? Right. Yes. Uh, the, in, 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 in speaking of, of Syria, how, how do you think, I mean, is it possible, I mean, what, what benefit could come in terms of the Syrian uh, conflict at this point in the event that uh, there is a, a more permanent deal struck? I think actually it's critical because at the end of the day, if you don't have the Iranians and the Saudis involved, you're not going to end the unfortunate bloodshed in Syria. It is true the Syrian uh, uprising started off as a genuine indigenous uprising against a dictator. 
the Syrian population wanted the same thing as everyone else had, and they saw what was happening in the rest of the region, and, and they acted on it. Unfortunately, after a while, because it ended up being indecisive, this struggle was hijacked both by a global rivalry between the U.S. and Russia, but more importantly by a regional rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And now it's turned into a very bloody sectarian civil war that is essentially fought primarily uh, through the support of Saudi and Iran. So if you want to resolve it, you have to address the problem. And Saudi and Iran are part of the problem. To, uh, to just get a sense, I mean, my, my sense is, is that, that in the event that um, a, a permanent deal is struck, the, the big losers uh, in this country, anyways, will be the neocons who, it seems to me, have uh, largely built, um, uh, I mean, uh, quite a movement, but uh, to the extent that their neocon movement has been uh, fueled, it has been by uh, creating this, this huge demon out of Iran. Um, wh- what is the, the flip side in Iran? Is it, uh, is it the Revolutionary Guard? I mean, who is it that will be the big losers, and how will it change uh, the, their domestic politics in the event that this deal is made? There's numerous losers on the Iranian side as well, uh, from the hardline uh, side. And, you know, some elements of the IRGC, some elements of the clergy, some of elements who actually have no ideological opposition necessarily to the United States, but who are very much opposed to what they fear is going to be a loss of economic interest uh, and economic gain. Um, that will occur if the U.S. and Iran improve their relationship, if Iran joins the global economy, if much of the protection of their industries are lifted and Iran is essentially competing, Iranian companies are competing on the same playing field that uh, international companies do inside the Iranian market. Right now, the Iranian economy is essentially, essentially a mafia economy and you have a couple of conglomerates that are controlling everything. And some of them are not willing to give up and that's part of the root of their opposition to the deal. And, 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 and I guess the, uh, the, the, the flip side of that is that there is a lot of Western um, industry that is looking to get inside of Iran. Sorry, could you repeat? Uh, I, I mean, I assume the flip side of that is that there is great pressure from Western industries to get into Iran markets. Uh, actually, not so much because the stigmatization of Iran has been so intense so that there's very few companies that dare to go out and say, hey, we want to make um, uh, business with Iran. However, if they pass this first phase successfully, then I think you will see a lot of companies feeling that it's worthwhile taking the risk of moving in that direction because of the fact that um, even if they will take a risk, the payoff seems to be so much more clearly there. Uh, and moreover, it's going to be far more European countries that are going to start off with that type of a pressure because they used to be in the Iranian economy just up until two, three years ago. Right. Uh, American companies have not really been in Iran for a few decades now. So th- there's no recent memory of ha- having just lost this and they want to regain it. Whereas some of the European companies had very strong positions on the Iranian market up until two years ago. And they're very eager to make sure that no American companies come in and take those. All right, so lastly, what, is the, what are the biggest sticking points, uh, the thorniest issues that we need to deal with for a, um, a, a final deal that we should be looking out for? I would say that right now what I'm most worried about in, in the immediate term is that Congress, as a result of issues that frankly have less to do with Iran than it has to do with the bad relationship between Congress and, and the White House, will do something to sabotage this deal. And I think it would be a shame if the American public are not involved in this conversation because they have a major opportunity for something historic here. But unless they're there involved expressing their views, uh, politics may uh, uh, overshadow all other calculations and we may end up losing this opportunity uh, because of some congressional action. They just have to pass a single sanctions act and the entire deal would unravel. Wow. All right. Well, um, uh, Trita Parsi, president of the National Iranian American Council, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you so um, much for having me. Appreciate it.